Today, we want to talk about the lost, right? The title is, I'm lost. Can anybody here identify with that? Has anybody ever felt like they're lost, like they're struggling, like they lack direction, okay? The Bible verse that we're going to reference today, write this down, is Luke chapter 19, verse 10. We're going to get that up there in just a moment, and I want to read that with you guys. So it says, it said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Who was here last, uh, last service, December? Do you guys remember the verse that I put up there? It was like three paragraphs. It was huge. So this time I was like, you know what? We're going to go with one a little bit uh, shorter. And God put this on my heart. The way that this came up, actually, God was like, Kyra's got a message that she wants to share. And so ask her what we're going to talk about. So I said, Kyra, give me one word. And, and this is what we're going to preach on. And she said, lost. And so I started doing some research, praying about it. And this is the verse that God gave me. So the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. I think we need to do some house cleaning though. Like uh, we need to get up to speed. Does that, not everybody knows or understands who the son of man is. So the son of man is Jesus. You guys, can we all get on the same page? The son of man is Jesus. He is referenced as the son of man over 88 times in the New Testament alone. You see, the son of man is uh, a title that comes with humility right? It's a title that comes with humanity. We have to understand the implications of what this means. This title, the son of man, means that God came to this earth and clothed himself in flesh. So many times we believe or think or feel as if maybe God doesn't understand us. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God doesn't hear us. But this verse here alone, this title that Jesus, like he he embodies, the son of man tells us that he understands. He understands us all too well. Many times in scripture, it talks about Jesus uh, being um, uh, moved in the spirit, right? It says in in the the gospel of John that Jesus wept, that he felt and experienced emotion and feelings. We know that he was also tempted with every temptation known to man. Jesus understands your problem. There's nothing that you're going through. There's nothing that you're dealing with. There's nothing that you're experiencing that Jesus doesn't understand. You guys get that? You hold on to that? So he is the son of man. It, 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 the, the son of man also, the last thing I want to say about this, is an intentional lowering of his status. You have to understand that God was king, is king of the universe. He lowered his status from being ruler to coming to the earth and being a servant. He came to this earth and he served us. If you guys follow me on Coffee and Prayer on Instagram, we were just talking about this uh, two days ago where Jesus came and he washed the disciples' feet. We have to understand that in the time where washing feet, the washing feet is something that you did for yourself. The only individuals who had other people wash their feet were people who were in positions of power. And and the individual who would wash feet was a servant. They were somebody who were lower. So as he was washing the, the, the disciples' feet, Peter said, Lord, you would never wash my feet. I wouldn't have you do that. But he took on that position, and and the feet that he's washing, these are people who were walking in sandals and barefooted across muddy roads and through dirt and through animal manure and and all kinds of things. So Jesus, the Son of Man, he came to this earth, right? He came to this earth to do what? To seek and to save the lost. Can we keep that up there the whole time? Because I'm going to come back to it multiple times. Thank you. So to seek. If you seek something, what does that mean? That means to attempt to find or to search, okay? If you're seeking something, you are searching for something. So Jesus came to this earth to what? To search, to search and to seek things out. What else did he come to do? He came to save, okay? What, is it, what, what, is, what does save mean? To rescue someone from harm or danger. Let that sink in. God came to earth. He wore flesh. He, he took on humility and humanity to search and to save something. What is it that he came to search for and to save? The lost. What is the lost defined as? And some of you guys might be able to resonate with this. To be lost means that you are unable to find your way or you don't know where you are. I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit do its work on that one, okay? Unable to find one's way. Does anybody in this place ever feel like they are unable to find their way? Maybe they don't know where they're at. I believe that there's several different kinds of loss. You can be saved and know Jesus as your savior and still be lost. Do you guys get that? You can be saved and know Jesus. You can follow Christ and still be lost. So who are the lost that we're talking about? I believe that each and every one of you are one of the lost. It's not a coincidence that you are here. You have been chosen. You have been set aside. God has brought you to this place. 
So you are the lost. And some of you might be like, Andrew, I'm saved, man. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not lost. But even, like I said, being saved, we can be lost, meaning that we're lacking direction, that we don't have guidance, that we don't know what we're doing. Am I talking to anybody out there? You can be saved serving God in a place and still lack direction. You can still be lost. So the question here, we kind of broke the verse down. Jesus came and he's searching and he's rescuing the lost. You guys, what is he saving us from? He's saving us from eternal separation from God. I, it, it would not, I would not be doing this stage justice if I didn't stand up here and talk about the issue of sin, the sin that separates us from God. Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, the payment that he made on that cross is saving us from our sin, the penalties that we deserve. Hell is real, my friends. Right? It is a very real thing. It is not what this world makes it to look out to be, where it's going to be a fun place, uh, where people are going to be partying and drinking and having a good time. And, you know, you're going to see your friends there, and you're going to be high-fiving and everyone. It, it's not like a, a, a weekend in Vegas. You know what I mean? It's not going to be fun. And that's not a shot at my Vegas peeps. Okay? That's just it's Sin City for a reason. You know, that's what they call it. Hell is real. And my, my question for you is this, is how does God seek you? How does he seek to save? I believe that God seeks us in many different ways. I believe that God was seeking some of you through worship. I think that God is seeking some of you through social media. He's seeking you through other people. He's seeking you through the word. He's seeking you through different signs and wonders and there's situations. God will seek you through rock bottom. He will seek you from the pits. He will allow you to go through some things in order to get your attention. Am I talking to anybody out there? Do any of you guys, are any of you guys going through something or dealing with something? I'm trying to tell you that when you're going through things and you're dealing with things, God is seeking your attention. He's trying to get a hold of you. He wants your guys' focus, your time, your energy, your effort, and your resources to be placed on him. He doesn't want to be second fiddle. He's searching you out. So I want to ask you guys this. Will you guys receive the help of God as, as he's seeking you out and he's trying to save you? He's trying to give you guidance, whether you're lost, lost, like you don't know where you're at, or you maybe you're lost, you don't know if you walked out of here and died, you don't know where you would go. Maybe you are saved, but you don't have any direction. You're kind of in this space where you're kind of unsure with what God's doing. Will you receive his guidance today? I had a couple of you guys, dope. So, um, Hopefully, a couple of you guys get something out of this. So for me, I believe that there's three kind of loss. There's more than three, but God, as I was praying through this, there's three kind of loss. Okay, there's people who are lost but confident. And I have to say that this was me. This is probably the best picture of myself. Has anybody ever been lost? Like, not just in life, but like lost on a hike or maybe lost because your GPS kind of, kind of went haywire and on your way here, maybe you were lost. See, I was the kind of person who if I was lost, I was confident. Being a man, I have this uh, innate sense of direction. And so despite me, you know, obviously being lost, I tend to be like, no, I got it. I'll circle back around. You know, no, um, I know right where I'm at. I remember that landmark. I'm confident, right? I'm lost. I don't want to admit it. Uh, typically, individuals who operate this, they struggle with a little bit of pride. So if you're like, that's not me, it's probably you. Um, struggle with a little bit of ego, maybe a little bit stubborn. Okay, so there's individuals in this place who are lost but you're confident that you got it. Yeah, I'll come back around. I'm lost, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna get back on my feet. I'm gonna really get back to it before I come back to Christ. Amen? The other kind of person is lost and terrified, okay? I don't like to admit it, but I've been lost and terrified. I grew up, I lived in Oregon, and so I always reference that. You guys are just like, he keeps talking about this Mr. mysterious place called Oregon. There's a lot of woods. There's a lot of things like that. I've been on hikes and got lost. So I believe that some of you are lost and terrified. And what that means is that as you're lost, you're expecting the worst, okay? As you're lost, you're making up scenarios. Like as you're lost, you're like, uh, there's going, I don't want to go the wrong way because there might be a cougar or a bear. There might be something around the corner. Uh, this, I've seen a movie about this where I'm going to have to cut off my arm and eat it. Like I've seen things. I've been in these places. I'm lost and I'm terrified. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. The worst is going to happen. And many people who operate in that, they operate in a level of fear. Is anybody in here bound by fear? Maybe anxiousness, maybe worried, maybe confused. Maybe that's where it kind of leads. You don't know what to do. 
You're, you're going through this world and you're watching the news and you're hearing this about the jab and you're hearing this about the second coming of Christ and you don't know what decision you need to make. You're confused. You're completely worried. You're filled with anxiousness. It's because you're lost and you're terrified. And then I think that the, the, thing, the third thing I'm going to talk about today is those who are lost and they don't know it. Okay, And I think that's some of you guys out here, people who are lost and don't know it, is they're just calm and they're just kind of going with the flow of life. They're just out here doing their thing. Uh, they are enjoying the ride. Okay, And I want to share a story with you in a second. Most of these people are typically passive or they're dismissive or they're curious or they're here searching. They're trying to figure things out. Like, you know, uh, I have this desire. There's this need. There's something that I'm missing. I'm curious, but I'm just going to kind of go with the flow. Right? So the story I want to share with you guys is... Um, I've lost a kid before, okay? I've lost my middle son, and uh, I share this because it's a great example of being lost without even knowing it. So uh, I took my kids to Disneyland, and it's me and my oldest and my middle son. And at the time, they were like nine and seven years old. And so we're there. We have an appointment at 12. We're supposed to have dinner with uh, the, one of the characters. We're supposed to have lunch with one of the characters. And so it's me and them. And so what we're doing is we're going to all the fast passes. We're getting fast passes and we're just hitting the park. We're hitting every single ride, trying to get as many as we can. We got the map out and we're just cooking. We're going through each one. Well, I got this idea that if we go single rider, we'll have to wait less and we can get more rides before noon. My kids are for it. I'm for it. We don't have anybody to tell us not to do it. So we're doing it. So here we are. We're, we're, we're getting close to the time. It's about 1130. We got 30 minutes before we have to get back to the hotel to have our, our little dinner with one of the characters. As we're leaving the park, there's one more ride. And the line looks fairly short. So I look at them, they look at me, and they're like, let's do it. Let's go. So here we go. We hop on, but it's single rider. So they split us up. And what we had been doing is I'd go with my oldest on one, I'd go with my youngest on the other, and the other one would ride solo. It, it wasn't an issue. Nothing had gone bad up to this point. So we go down this uh, corridor, and he's in this line, we're in this line. We get to this bend, and there's 50 people in each line ahead of us. We couldn't see that. And so we're looking at the time, we're like, Let's, let's, we've got this. Let's hang in there. So my middle son's line takes a left. Ours takes a right. And as we're going right, I'm still making eye contact with him, looking. And, okay, I can still see him. You good? We're good. Awesome. Okay. And I'm talking to my, my older son. And I'm like, I hope that this, we get out at the same time. I don't know what's going to happen. And so his line starts moving a lot faster than ours. And then he takes another turn and I can't see him. Okay, my middle son, he's seven years old, maybe, maybe eight at the time, gone. I can't see him. And so we're in the line. Our line's not moving. More people are coming on their line, and it's moving. I'm starting to panic. Like, okay, what if he gets on the ride and gets off, and I'm not out there? Okay, and before you guys judge me, I wasn't a terrible dad. I was trying to get as many rides as I possibly could. It was for the kids. It was for the children. It was a responsible decision at the time. Okay, I've learned from that. So about 10 minutes goes by. Our line isn't moving. We haven't even got on the ride. So we're just like, you know what? Let's go to the exit because he might have already gotten on and gotten off. So we run out there and we're sitting there and a group of people come out. He's not with them. Okay. So you guys can imagine my panic level, the level of like anxiety. I'm like, oh my God, I just lost a kid, like an entire human being. I've lost my middle child. Another group of people come out. He's not with them. So I send my oldest son down the tunnel. I go, hey, go in there and, and look, I'll stand here. We got to find this kid. So my oldest son goes down there. Another group of people come out on the ride. He's not with them. So at this point, I'm like imagining the worst, right? My son is in the back of a van eating candy down the road in Anaheim somewhere. Like I've lost a child, okay, gone. So at this point, we're like, okay, I got my phone out. I'm about to call security. It's happening. Another group of people come out and here comes my son. And he's just, oh man, that was such a great ride. Just, oh man, that was awesome. I'm almost in tears, filled with panic and terror. The idea of almost losing my son, but he's walking around carefree as if nothing happened because in his eyes, nothing did. He's walking around carefree, just having a good time. And I believe that there's individuals like that. You guys might be here. You might be just wandering through life, just having a good old time, not knowing that there is an implication for the way that you are living. If you do not give your life to Jesus, right? We all understand and know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not okay. It's not enough to just be passively cruising and going with the flow. The sin in your life, there is a very real consequence. And we understand that the Son of Man came to seek the lost, right? And we are the lost. And there's individuals who are operating under that. So I got a couple of questions for you guys. 
And answer these to yourself in your own spirit, in your own heart. Where do you fit in? What kind of lost are you? Maybe you're found. Maybe you're somebody who is found. Maybe you've been doing this, this Jesus thing. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while now. But you lack direction. Or you feel like you're lost. I think a lot of people wonder, and maybe this is you, how do you, how do you get found? Maybe you're here today and you're wondering to yourself, how do I get found? I'm going to share that with you and I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to not only be found, but maybe to rededicate your life at the very end of this to Jesus. But you become found by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, by inviting him into your life, renouncing your sin, repenting, which is a change of direction, and living a life for him. But the big question is, is what do you do once you get saved, right? Imagine everybody in here has said that prayer. Everybody's accepted Jesus as their savior. Everybody in here is essentially found, but maybe lost. What do you do? And in this moment, I want to look to the greatest command, what Jesus instructs us. He says the greatest of the commands is this. It's found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So love, there's this element of love. So let's say you've been found. Today you're going to leave this place found, okay? Whether you're going to be saved, you're going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But where do we go once we are found? What do we do once we are found? How do we apply this information? How do we leave this place and be different? How do we apply this? We do this through love. And so we ask ourselves, what is love? And now this isn't, uh, I don't have this up on a slide, but we understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful. Love is not arrogant or rude. It doesn't uh, insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So we can use this as a guideline. Are we patient with God? We say that we love God. We're, we're professing with our mouth that we love God, but are we patient with him? We say that we love God. Are we patient with people? We're, we're, we're sitting here saying that we love God, but are we kind? Are we being kind with people? Are we not envious or boastful, arrogant or rude? Can we apply these things to our relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters? It doesn't insist on its own way. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of Christians who insist on their own way. They want what they want and they want it their way. And many times when God's saying no or directing them, or taking them in a different direction, they're frustrated, they're angry, they're wagging their fist at God. They don't rejoice in the truth. Now, I wanna, I wanna share something, right? If, if any of this right now is convicting, if you're just like, man, I can do better. I can be more patient, I can be more kind, I can be more understanding. You know, my, my, my goal isn't to make you guys feel bad about yourself. Why am I coming to church, man? I came here to have my ears tickled, I want this sugar-coated, I wanna feel good and motivated and inspired after I leave here. That's not what this is about. Allow the Holy Spirit to do its work. If you're feeling like, okay, I've I'm, I'm been lost, I need some direction, I need to do a better job at, at loving God, what is it that I need to do now that I'm found? I want you to know that you're in the right place, okay? You're a new creation in, G in Christ Jesus. But we must understand that we cannot continue living the way that we were living before. Amen? We cannot continue to do the same thing over and over and over again, these repetitive cycles of sin. There must be change and there must be transformation. And this is the very place that I want you guys to be. I want you to be here in church. I want you to be with the body of Christ. Church isn't just the four walls. But I want to encourage you guys that there's some things that I want you to incorporate into your life. There's a couple of habits, three habits that I want to share. The first one is prayer. So, so bringing this all together, let's say you're found. What does God want you to do now that you're found? One of the key ingredients is communication with God through prayer. You speaking to God. And you say, well, Andrew, we've been here four times now, and we've talked about prayer every time. Let's talk about something different. Why? Why would we talk about anything different? Can anybody in here improve their prayer life? 
right? I feel like everybody's hand should be up. Um, I'm not going to call you guys out. Kyra, put your hand up. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but our prayer life, it is a foundation of what we're doing. It is a foundation Right? I, I don't know. I've never met an on-fire Christian, somebody who's on fire for God, who's living out their full plan, the full purpose that God has for them, who is not regularly in prayer. So this is a new habit. As a found Christian, we, we, we don't, what we don't do is we don't fit God into our schedule. Our schedule should be built around God. So it's not us finding little bits and pieces, little times where we can put God into our day. Our day should be built around God. And it starts with prayer. It also starts with devotion, devoting time to knowing and understanding the scriptures. The scripture is our truth. It says that the Bible is our sword. In Ephesians 6, the word of God is our sword. We are in a very real spiritual battle and your soul is on the line. How would I look if I show up to a battle without my sword? We can't keep making excuses that we don't have time to read the word. I don't understand how to read the word. I don't know where to start when I read the word. I'll tell you this, and this is a shameless plug. Every single day for the last 86 days, I have read one chapter from the New Testament live on Instagram and one chapter from the Old Testament. I haven't missed a day. I've been from every four corner in this entire nation. Three different time zones. Haven't missed a day. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. What I'm saying is that there is no excuse I also save that live. So if you can't make it at the time that I wake up, you can always go back and read it. If you want to know where, start there. If you want to know how, start there. We not only devote time, energy, and effort to reading the scripture, but also praying at the end. So there, there's very real, practical ways. There is no excuse. The only person who's believing your excuses is you. Let's stop that. New habits. We're bringing in the new. Out with the old, in with the new. And the other thing is Fellowship. Yes, fellowship is important. Fellowship is key. We need to be around believers. As I was, you know, walking around and, and, and talking and engaging with people before we started, some of the things that I heard is just the, the power of uh, taking people away who no longer um, play a role in our life. As 2022 is rolling in, God is wanting to do new things. And we can't keep doing the old, same old things with the same old people. Now, I believe that, and I'm not saying cut everybody out of your life. I believe that God has us in specific people's lives. But to, but to what degree, right? We are there to be a light. We are there to shine bright. We are there to pull and direct people and guide them closer to Jesus. But if they're pulling us further away, okay, we've outstayed our welcome. That is not the relationship, friendship, friend group, the place that God has called us to be. Amen? So fellowship. So three new habits, three, three things that God wants us to do as we love God, as we are found, as we apply these things, we need to work on our habit of prayer, devoting time, and energy, and effort to the scripture and to fellowship, building new relationships, connections, right? Creating these networks of individuals who are, are, are running the same race and are heading in the same direction. What does light and darkness have in common? They have nothing in common. So many of us, as we're walking into this new year, we need to prune some things, prune some areas in our lives, prune some habits, prune some things that are no longer serving us, no longer serving us. Oh, I already got the light? Woo, what time is it? Good Lord. Okay. I got a whole nother page. So, okay, check it out. I'll be brief. The big thing here is um, purpose. You guys, we each... As you're found, as you're new, you have a purpose. Each and every one of you have a purpose in the place that you're at. So many of us believe that our purpose is a destination. Our purpose is not a destination. It's not a place that you go. Do you guys understand that? God has you in a specific place currently, today, and the place that you're at is where your purpose is found. Does that make sense? You guys are there for a reason. Many of us believe that our purpose is going to come with promotion. But I don't know about you, but if you're in a place and you're promoted in that place, it can come in several different ways. You can get a promotion while you get more responsibility in that place, right? If you're promoted in a place, you might be relocated. So God might promote you in a place and take you to another. As you're promoted in a place, you might not leave. You might get more responsibility. Does that make sense? You might advance your title or your role. So many of us are believing that our purpose is found outside of the place that we're in, but I'm here to tell you that each and every one of you, there are people in your life, your friend group, okay, the, the, the sports group that you're a part of, your work, your school, every place that you are in, you have a sphere of influence, and God has a purpose for you in that place. Here's the thing. God is not going to 
promote you if you're not being faithful with the things that you have in your life right now. So if there are people in my life who need to be saved, there's two or three souls that have my name written on them and God has me in that place to minister to them. If I'm not faithful with them, what makes you think that he's going to promote me to a bigger, better calling? I need to be faithful with the small in the place that I'm at. So as a follower of Christ, as the new found, as you guys are being found, understand you must devote time to prayer. You must devote time to reading your word. You must start fellowshipping with other believers and you must understand your purpose. Our purpose, our lives are not about us. Our lives are not about us. Do you guys understand that? I want to use my gifts. I want to use everything that God has given me to make Jesus known. And it's the same thing for each and every one of you. Each and every one of you have a calling to ministry. Now, your ministry might not be up here on this platform, but your ministry, ministry means what? It means to serve. We were created as followers of Jesus to serve him, to serve him. In what capacity are you serving God as newfound? Many of us believe that this world revolves around us. And this world tells us that, does it not? This world tells us, YOLO, get out there, live your best life. You only live once. Do what makes you happy. Follow your heart. That couldn't be further from the truth. When you gave your life to Christ, when he sought you, when he saved you and he found you, you are no longer your own. You're his. And because we're his, we're meant to serve him in the place that you are at. So stop praying to get out of the place that you are in currently because God wants to use you in that place. Whether it's uncomfortable, it might be hard, it might be challenging, it might be sad, you might be depressed. The place that you're at, God wants to use you in that place. And you won't be removed from that place until you fulfill the purpose. Right? It's like a video game. You guys, who knows about Mario? Where's my Mario players at, right? Here's the thing. Level one, you get through it. You don't get to go to level two until you're done with that level. Does that make sense? You don't get to advance. You're on a level right now, and God wants to use you in that place. You don't get to go to King Koopa's castle until you're done with this level. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. So your purpose is found in the place that you are at right now. So stop believing that it's a destination. You, God has you right where he wants you, right in this place. And this today is a wake-up call. Hey, snap out of it. Snap out of it. Stop believing that it's a place or a destination. He wants to use you today. You guys, go ahead and bow your heads. <sighs> Listen, you guys, don't leave here lost. Don't miss the message. Don't miss this chance, this opportunity. God has brought you to this place in this point in time to hear this message. And he wants you to make a decision today. Whether you've been found for a while, God still wants to use you. Whether you've been found for a while, God wants to reveal that plan. He wants obedience. He wants submission. He wants a willing body. You guys, don't miss this opportunity to get reset. So as you guys are looking at the ground if God's speaking to you, encouraging you, Holy Spirit's on top of you. He's saying, look, man, this is where we need to be. This is what we need to do. We need more prayer. We, we, need, more, we, we, we need more word. We need more fellowship. We need to start operating within the bounds of our purpose. If that's you, if that's somebody here, you're here and you want to move forward with God, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to slide your hand in the air and say, Lord, I'm here. God, use me. Lord, send me. I am available. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys can put those hands down. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you who, who make that decision, not just for Christ, but to start walking in what God has for you. I can tell you that I've lived a life far from the call of God, way out of his will, in direct opposition. And there is nothing more powerful and purposeful and fulfilling and satisfying than being a servant to Jesus Christ. Nothing else compares, not money, not fame, not clout, not travel, not experience. There's nothing that can even compare when you are living fully in the purpose and the plan that he has for you. Maybe you're in this place and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, not once, not never. 
not never. I want you to slide your hand up in the air and receive him today. Yes, 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 I see that, I see that, I see that. For those of you with your heads bowed and uh, have received Jesus, I want you to pray this with me. You can say it to yourself, you don't have to say it out loud, say it in your heart, say it to him. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge my sin and I know that it separates me from God. But I receive your free gift of salvation that is only offered to me because of your death, burial, and resurrection. I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one enters heaven except through you. So Jesus, I invite you to be the Lord of my life and the savior of my soul. In Jesus' name, amen.